Today we're going to be learning all about bar graphs. We're going to start off by quickly talking about what bar graphs are. A bar graph is a way of representing data graphically using bars of different lengths that show us the frequency of the data for different categories or groups. Bar graphs are used to represent discrete data, which is data that can be counted. When drawing a bar graph, we need to follow certain rules. So here's an example of a bar graph. Okay. Now, this bar graph, you can see the bars over here. They are showing us like apples. This is all favorite fruits. Okay. So people's favorite fruits. So there are 18 people whose favorite fruit is apples. There are 12 people whose favorite fruit is are oranges. So the bar graph, you can see the frequency or the number of, in this case, number of learners who have these particular favorite fruits. Okay, so the bar graph is showing this to us graphically. The rules that we have to follow are as follows. First of all, you have to make sure that everything is labeled when you're working with a bar graph. So we have to have a title. That is the whole bar graph has to be labeled to show what it is actually about. Okay, so the title. Then we have also got to label our axes. Okay, we've got over here the number of learners and over here it's the different fruits. Then we also have to label the bars and say what each of those bars represents as well. So this bar is for apples, this bar is for oranges, this bar is for pears and so on. So everything has to be properly labeled. The next thing you have to make sure is you have to have gaps in between your bars when you're doing a bar graph. We're still going to learn about histograms, which look very similar to bar graphs. They are the ones that don't have gaps between the bars. Okay, so in a bar graph, there must be gaps in between. Then over here, this is where we've got the uh, scale, which is what we're counting in. That scale has to be consistent it has to have all the same, it has to all be the same size intervals, okay, the same size gaps over here, and it has to be consistent numbers as well. So in this case, we're counting in twos. Now, the interval that you choose for your axis over here will depend on the data that you're working with, okay? So you might need to have much bigger numbers. In this case, it's counting in twos. You might need to count in fives or tens or twenties or hundreds or whatever is appropriate for the data that you're working with. Make sure that when you are doing your scale, that it is easy to read. So don't try and cram too many numbers in. Rather use intervals so that you don't have to cram too many numbers in. But at the same time, you need to make it so that you can also read what the bars are. So you don't want to have, like in this case, I wouldn't be counting in tens because then if there were no numbers in between, it would be much more difficult to know what each of these bars actually is. So you need to also take that into account. So the amount of space that you have for drawing your bar graph is going to influence the intervals that you're going to use. Also, the data that you're working with is going to influence the intervals you're going to use and making sure that you can actually read the graph properly. Okay, so that's your intervals over there. Then you also need to make sure that your bars are all the same width. You can't have some bars that are much wider than other bars because it's going to give a false impression of the data. If you have a bar over here that is much wider than, another, than the other bars, it gives the impression that it's representing a bigger number than it actually is. So it's going to be misleading for people who are reading the graph. All the bars need to be consistent widths. Also, in terms of the scale, you need, as I said already, you need to make sure that you're using consistent intervals as well. You can't go from 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and then suddenly jump to 20, because that's also going to be misleading for people who are reading the graph. You need to make sure that it is, um, you need to make sure that it is consistent. Then also you need to make sure that the gaps in between the bars are all the same size as well. Okay, so everything needs to be consistent. And so when you're doing when you're drawing your bar graph, make sure you label everything. Your graph has to have a title, your axes need to be labeled, and you need to make sure that your 
scale over here is labeled and all the bars are labeled the scale needs to be consistent with consistent intervals your bars need to all be the same size all the same width as each other and your gaps need to all be the same size as each other as well please make sure that you use a ruler when you are drawing your bar graph don't try and do it freehand because it needs to be accurate which means that you need to use a ruler right so now we're going to do an example where you are going to draw your own bar graph following all of the rules that we've gone through here. Okay, so over here, all the learners in the grade were asked what their favorite movie genre was, and the results were recorded in the frequency table below. So over here, we've got all the movie genres that they were asked about. There's romance, comedy, action, horror, thriller, fantasy, and sci-fi, and then the number of learners that selected each of those as their favorites. So you need to take all of this data and you need to draw a bar graph to represent the data in the table. I'm going to give you five minutes to draw this bar graph. Make sure that you do it neatly with a ruler.
Okay, so let's take a look at what your graph should have looked like. So over here, this is what my graph looked like when I did it. So over here on the left, on this axis, I have got my scale. Now I chose to do intervals of two. You may have chosen a different scale to what I did, depending on the space that you were working with and so on. If you were working on the worksheet, then you may well have done twos, but if you're working on a smaller space, say only half a page, then you may have done counting in fives or something like that. So your scale might be a little bit different. Just make sure that you do it accurately and you try and make it as easy to read as possible. Okay. Make sure that everything is labeled. So here I've got the heading or the title for my graph. I just called it favorite movie genre. Then on the side over here, I have labeled the axis. It is number of learners and over here I've got the movie genres and then each of the bars is labeled for the genre that it is representing. So romance goes up to 40 over there, comedy goes up to 34, action goes up to the 26, horror goes up to 42, thriller goes up to 25 I think it was, fantasy goes up to 33, or 32, sorry, so over here this was 32. It's a little bit difficult to see on the screen. And sci-fi goes up to 41. So that is what your graph should look like. Now we're going to go on to double bar graphs. Double bar graphs are useful for when you're wanting to compare two data groups. A double bar graph is a graphical representation of two groups of data on the same graph using two bars beside each other for each category. The bars for the two sets of data are usually different colors or patterns, which are then shown with the key so that the person who's reading that graph knows what the different colors represent. Okay, so over here, I have got one that we're going to be doing. This, In this case, you're not going to be drawing the graph. You've been given the graph and you're going to be answering questions based on the graph. So it says class one and class two decided to have a friendly competition to see which class could read the most books over a six month period. Each month, the number of books read by the students in both classes was recorded. The results of this reading challenge were tracked and represented in the graph below. So here we've got our graph. Okay, so now, first of all, when you're going to be doing a question like this, so I'm just putting it there again you need to make sure that you are reading this accurately. Now, it's a little bit difficult to read on a screen, as we saw when I was trying to read in the last one. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put these lines in here for you to be able to read it more easily. If you are working on a page like you would normally be doing, then what you can do is you can take your ruler and you can use the ruler to help you to see what the values are for each of the bars by lining it up like that so you can see what it lines up with on the axis over here. Okay, so when you are working on a page like this, then you can use your ruler to help you. But obviously on the screen, it's a little bit more difficult. So I'm putting those lines in there for you to be able to see. Okay, so you're going to be answering a few questions now about the data represented in this graph. I'm going to give you a few seconds for each of the questions. Here's the first one. How many books did class two read in March? Then question B, which class read the most books in April? Question C, in June, how many more books did class two read than class one? Question D, how many books did class one read in February, March, and April combined? Question E, how many more books did class one read in July than in March?
Question F. In which month did Class 1 and Class 2 read the same number of books? And then here's the last question. How many books did each class read together, all together, and which class won the competition? So I'm going to give you a minute to work this one out. Okay, so let's see how you should have done those questions. So the first question was, how many books did class 2 read in March? So over here, class 2 is this one over here. In March, class 2 read 35 books. Okay, so that's 35 books over here. Then, question B, which class read the most books in April? So in April, the class that read the most books was this one over here, that's class one. Question C. In June, how many more books did class two read than class one? Okay, so we're looking at June. Class two, we need to find out how many they read. That was 65. So we've got 65 minus how many class one read, which is 35. That gives us 30 more books. Okay, so class two read 30 more books than class one in June. Question D, how many books did class one read in February, March, and April combined? So we need to add up the, the number of books that class one read in February, which is 30 plus March, which is 45, plus April, which is 60. Okay, you can see over there, 60. And that gives us 135 books. Right, then the next question, how many more books did class one read in July than in March? So in July, class one read over there is 60 books minus in uh, March class 1 read 45 books. We're subtracting because we want to know how many more they read there than there. So I'm subtracting and that gives me 15 more books. Qu uh, question F. In which month did class 1 and class 2 read the same number of books? If you look, the only month where they have the same amount was May. And then the last question, how many books did each class read all together and which class won the competition? So now we need to work out the total amount for both classes, for each class, and we need to then see which one is higher. So class one is 30 plus 45 plus 60 plus 50 plus 35 plus 60 and that gives us a total 30 plus 45 plus 60 plus 50 plus 35 plus 60 is 280. So that's how many books class one read. Now let's have a look at class two. Okay, so class two started with 45 plus 
35 plus 45 plus 50 plus over here 65 and then finally over here 50. Okay, so if we add all of that up, we get 45 plus 35 plus 45 plus 50 plus 65 plus 50. And that gives us 290 books altogether. So because class 2 read more books, they won the competition. So therefore, class 2 won. Now, when you're doing questions like this, in a test situation, be careful and look at how many marks are allocated, particularly for questions like these ones where there are calculations involved. If it's only one mark, then you can just write on the answer. But if there are two marks allocated, make sure that you show the calculations. Because if you happen to make a mistake typing into your calculator, then you can still get a mark for writing down the calculation. Okay, so just be careful when you're doing questions like this that you make sure that you show the calculation particularly if you are being given marks for that. And if it is two marks, then you have to show the calculation. Otherwise, you might only get one of the two marks if you only show the answer. So just be aware of that, that you need to get used to showing your calculations, even though they are very simple calculations. Okay, and that is how we work with bar graphs. Now that we've learned the concepts in this lesson, it's important to practice, practice, practice. If you haven't already got the worksheet that goes with this video, you can find it by clicking on the link in the description below. The worksheet comes with an extra exercise full of questions for you to work on to master the concepts covered in this lesson. If you found this video helpful, please hit the like button so that others can benefit from it too. Also, be sure to subscribe so that you can easily find my other lessons and hit the bell so that you will get notified about lessons as I upload them.